All right, we'd like you to take your Bible this morning and go to 2 Chronicles chapter 12. 2 Chronicles chapter 12 in your Bible this morning. And uh, 2 Chronicles is right after 1 Chronicles. Just, just to let you know. And, uh, and that's before Mark 11. Just, you know, kind of get you in the ballpark. Amen. <clears throat> So I think I'll pray first. Is that okay? I'll pray first, and it feels pretty comfortable in here. You, it feel okay, and uh, if it if it uh, if it gets too cold, uh, you won't go to sleep. And uh, we should pray, okay? Heavenly Father, thank you for you. Thank you for this time. Now we have uh, uh, to consider your word for us here this morning. We're thankful that we have uh, what we call the Bible before us. Your very words, your mind, um, history. Uh, theology and the practical things of life and we're grateful that you have not left us to ourselves we have your word before us uh, we're thankful for it we pray Holy Spirit you'd help us to be attentive and receptive uh, to what the Lord God has for us today uh, from the sermon time <clears throat> and may it be profitable for us and our life as we seek to honor the Lord uh, may it be profitable too if somebody's here without Christ uh, as we think about uh, the topic of, of uh, eventually we'll get to the topic of humility where we even to trust Christ as Savior, we, we need to humble ourselves before him and confess our need of him for that gift of eternal life and forgiveness of sins. And so we pray this time will be helpful. We pray that it'll be helpful for now and for later along the road of life. In your name, Lord, we pray. Amen. So I let the cat out of the bag in prayer. Maybe I won't pray first next time. You know, yeah, I won't do that. This anyway. So we're in Second Chronicles, not Second Corinthians. Second Chronicles, chapter twelve. And we're going to talk about Rehoboam again. We talked about him before about a particular thing. This is a totally different sermon. Okay, uh, from Second Chronicles, chapter twelve, uh, a, a very different topic uh, than last time because you don't even remember what what the other sermon was about Rehoboam like a while ago. I think it was out of Kings, wasn't it? Wasn't it out of First Kings? Wasn't it? Wasn't it? We don't even know that. Okay. Yeah. We, too long ago. It was at least three weeks ago. It was too long. No, it's longer than that. It's longer than that. I don't even remember what I preached last week unless I go to the church website. Here's my commercial. Go to the church website <laughs> and plunk it in, you know? And, uh, man, you, you guys are making me feel bad. I hope you don't do this to Cameron or anybody else that they preach, you know? Man, I hope you, you know, I go to the church website, you know, and I, I punch in the, you know, the sermon thing and it's from YouTube, but it's on our website. And, uh, boy, I hate being the first view. You know, I can't even get my wife to, you know, and this, you, you looked at it, <laughs> you looked at it, but you didn't listen to it. Yeah, oh, oh, okay. I got you. And, and then on top of, Insult to injury. Hi, Michelle. I love you. You know, you, you know, I do. Okay. So Michelle was listening to last week's sermon because the Wallens weren't here. They away for the, for the weekend. They were listening to, she was listening to last week's sermon. And, and I, and I, and I appreciate, what's that? At work at First Baptist in Pedricktown. Way to go. You know, you got this double loyalty going on. You know, anyway, now don't get the pastor mad over there. Okay. And, Yeah. Yeah, good. Did you, and I, that's why I told Cameron, she wrote me on a text and said how great it sounded. She never said the sermon was any good. So I was like, you know, but you know, I didn't have the heart to ask you. I figured I better leave it alone because I, because if you don't say so, I don't want to know. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so anyway, where, where are we at? Where are we at this morning? We're on, at least on planet Earth, right? Man. Uh, except for Mark Gazerowski. He's, he's might be a little some other place, but hey, we love you, Mark. Hi. Jupiter. Jupiter. There you go. See, at least he knows where he's at anyway. Yes. But anyway, Second Chronicles chapter 12, and it came to pass when Rehoboam had established the kingdom and had strengthened himself, he forsook the law of the Lord and all Israel with him. And it came to pass in the fifth year of King Rehoboam, Shishak, uh, uh, king of Egypt, uh, came up against Jerusalem because they had transgressed against the Lord. 
with 1,200 chariots, maybe that would be almost like tanks now or heavy artillery, and 60,000 horsemen. Wow, they brought the cavalry. Okay. And the people were without number that came with him out of Egypt, the Lubim, Succums, and the Ethiopians. And he took the fenced cities which pertained to Judah and came to Jerusalem. Then came Shemaiah the prophet to Rehoboam and to the princes of Judah that were gathered together to Jerusalem because of Sishak and said unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Ye have forsaken me, and therefore have I also left you in the hand of Sishak, uh, whereupon the princes of Israel and the king humbled themselves, and they said, The Lord is righteous. When the Lord saw that they humbled themselves, the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah, saying, They have humbled themselves, therefore I will not destroy them, but I will grant them some deliverance, and my wrath shall not be poured out upon Jerusalem by the hand of Sishak. Nevertheless, they shall be his servants, that they may know my service and the service of the kingdoms of the countries. So Sishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem and took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He took all, and he carried away also the shields of gold which Solomon had made. And instead of which King Rehoboam made shields of brass, committed them to the hands of the chief of the guard uh, that kept the entrance of the king's house, and when the king entered into the house of the Lord, the guard came and fetched them and brought them again into the guard chamber. And when he humbled himself, the wrath of the Lord turned from him that he would not destroy him altogether. And also in Judah, things went well. So King Rehoboam strengthened himself in Jerusalem and reign, reigned for Rehoboam was one and 40 years old when he began to reign and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem. And the city which the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. And his mother's name was Nama, an Ammonitess. And he did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. Now the acts of Rehoboam first and last, are they not written in the book of Shemaiah the prophet and Ido the seer concerning genealogies? And there were wars between Rehoboam and Jeroboam continually. And Rehoboam slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David, and Abijah, his son, reigned in his stead. Let me talk to you about when this is happening, when this is happening, just, so, just a little bit, so we just don't, like, start talking about something and, and, and leave you nowhere to, like, to plant your feet. Uh, the, uh, what we have in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 12 is not many years after the kingdom of Israel was divided. The kingdom of Israel was divided. Okay, and in the division, then you had the southern kingdom, okay, Judah, you had the northern kingdom, Israel, two distinct kingdoms. Israel wind up being divided, okay? Now, if you remember about how that happened, there was revolt insurrection due to the government of Solomon and Rehoboam, who is Solomon's son, who is king after Solomon. Uh, the kingdom stood together as this revolt and insurrection takes place, Okay, and uh, because this took place, because because uh, um, they were consuming the kingdoms of Solomon and piggyback to Rehoboam, uh, consuming vast amounts of the people's productivity, and the people wanted the people wanted they had they got a leader Jeroboam, and they went before the king. The people wanted tax relief from the kingdom and the king. They wanted time relief to tend to their own family needs, and they also wanted thought relief. Thought relief. You say, what kind of what do you mean thought relief? In other words, the idea was uh, they wanted the government authorities to think different about what was going on in the kingdom. Not only did they want tax relief and some time relief for their own families and tend to their own needs, not just productivity to support the kingdom, they wanted, they wanted thought relief. They wanted the government authorities to realize that the government was there to serve the people, serve the people well instead of the people existing to serve a bloated, bureaucratic, boastful government. So what happened, the kingdom, uh, you know, Rehoboam, you know, with the young counselors decided that's not how it's going to be. We're not giving them any relief about anything. In fact, we're going to make things harder for them, for the people. And so the kingdom then is divided. Northern kingdom, there's 10 tribes. They're led by Jeroboam. They're going to wickedness and sin almost immediately. 
and the southern kingdom, uh, Judah and Benjamin, uh, the capital is still Jerusalem, and Rehoboam is the king there. Time of our text. So our time of our text is about five years after what I call the Civil War. There was a civil war when it, with this insurrection and this, this revolt, and I call it a civil war, and it broke the country. It was fractured. It was broken. Now you have two kingdoms. The time is about five years after the Civil War has concluded. The kingdom now is separated in two distinct kingdoms. Uh, Judah, the kingdom that you have here in our text, ruled by Rehoboam, uh, the kingdom, this kingdom is now settled. Once the dust settles, you know, they build and they, they go forward. Uh, the kingdom is strong, we see in the text. The kingdom, uh, we're told also is still at strife with Israel. There's war from time to time now, um, against these two, uh, groups of people, these two nations that are Jewish and supposedly have the same God. And also with this kingdom, with this kingdom, uh, they sinfully, they sinfully decide at a point in time, to forsake the Lord. And it says here in our text that the king, at a point in time, the king forsook the Lord, and that's bad enough. But but the fact of the matter is, it's worse than that, because verse number one says, not only did the king forsake the Lord, it says all Israel followed. How sad. And when it says forsaken the Lord, forsaken means left behind. It just, in that verse, it means left behind. It means abandoned, let loose from. They let themselves loose from the Lord. They let it go. So what we have, first of all, so all this begins to unfold after this brief civil war where the kingdom is divided, two separate distinct kingdoms. We're talking about the southern kingdom where Solomon's son Rehoboam still reigns. At a point in time, he and those, their government authorities that are high and close to him, they decide, you know, we're just going to leave the Lord behind. We're going to go on without him. And uh, that's bad enough. What's worse is all Israel followed them. Followed them. And then what you have in verses two through four, what you do, uh, the second thing is you, you have, uh, sovereign nations, their war commences. You said, really? Yeah. Like I said, this is about five years after the Civil War. You have the rival of the Egyptian armies against the southern kingdom, Judah. The war commences. Because of the power of the Egyptian armies and what they brought with them and who they brought with them and the, and the, the weapons of war, uh, uh, the Egyptians had already ravished and ruined the rural areas of Judah, and now they prepare to ransack Jerusalem. And lo and behold, the man of God shows up. Okay. And there's an announcement by the man of God from the mouth of God, from the mind of God and the mouth of God, in verse number five, why the Egyptians were knocking at the door at the capital city of Jerusalem. And he said, this is God's message to you. You have forsaken me, so I've left you to the Egyptians. Now, in this particular time, you read, look at glance at verse number six, you would find out, you'd see that the government officials, including the king, they, it says they humbled themselves when they heard this. They humbled themselves when they heard this, and they confessed, they confessed the Lord is righteous. Okay? In essence, when they're saying the Lord is righteous, you know, we've sinned, we trespassed, we're wrong. They're saying the Lord is right, and we're the ones that are wrong. We're the ones that have sinned against him. We're the ones that have trespassed against him. Now it says when they heard the message of God, when the Egyptians are knocking at the city gates, okay, and uh, set for its destruction, okay, and they hear the message from the man of God, okay, from God, it says they humbled themselves. The Lord's righteous, not us. We're wrong. We're sinful. Now, when it says they humbled themselves, that they brought themselves into subjection to the Lord and his will at that particular time. 
The idea of humble in that verse means it, it, it's, it's got three things. And this happens, first of all, internally in somebody's life, okay, in their mind, in their spirit. This is what happens. And then, and then almost always is somehow it's worked out in life. Something happens in life. The idea about humble means down, means low, means under. So what they decided to do was, was, was get off the, the pride ride in their lives as they left God behind, okay, and decided to bring themselves down again, bring themselves under the authority of the Lord again, claiming he's righteous, they're sinful and wrong. It's sort of like, uh, maybe they realize this a little bit. Maybe they just want to save their skin. Who knows? The enemy's right there at the gate. You know, they're in trouble now. It's serious. It's for real. And it looks like there's no way out of this. But it's like First Peter chapter 5, verse 6 says, Humble yourselves under, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Now, point number three is found in verses 5 through 13. What I call this is, is the sovereign Lord's character through all this. What's happening is communicated. The sovereign Lord's character is communicated. What, what he's like is communicated as all this is unfolding. And in those verses, you find that God is righteous. You'll find that God is relational because God was jealous for his people and he didn't like them saying, hey, we're hitting the road. We're, we're where we want to be. See a God. We're done with you. No, he's jealous for them and, and the relationship he has with them. We see something else about the Lord and his character. He's ready to renew his place in the life of the king and the kingdom. We find that he's truthful. He's merciful. He's gracious. He's generous and he's forgiving. We see this all in these verses, and we find out, uh, we would say he's wise and knowledgeable, but for us as God, you know, he's all wise, he's infinite in knowledge. Uh, we see how God works this thing in his loving, thoughtfulness, and kindness toward these people that turned their back on him, but now they humbled themselves and declare he's the righteous one, and they were not. Um, we, we see what he does, though, in his wisdom and in his knowledge. We see this by what he does, what God does, he leaves the consequences in place of their walk away from the Lord. He said, what? Yeah. So even though the Lord spared them from the enemy armies, the Lord recognized their humility and responded to that in a generous, gracious way. He, he left consequences with them of what they had done. Okay? You know? Just like you. You get off your pride place and you humble yourself before the Lord again and you claim he's righteous and you were wrong or you're, you've sinned. And God says, that's great. We'll be back in a right relationship with each other as you humble yourself before me and I'll lift you up. But listen... Since you walked away and these things unfolded, you have some consequences. We hate consequences when it's like that. You know, if we're walking with the Lord, you know, there's consequences to that too, you know, in fruitfulness and blessing. But there's also consequences the other way when we walk away from them. And so the Lord in his wisdom and his understanding and his knowledge, he, he leaves the consequences in place of their walk away from him. If you read, if you read through that again, if you glance at it, you find out that the Egyptians confiscated vast amounts of the riches from the kingdom treasuries and the kingdom's wealth in Judah and Jerusalem. In fact, they confiscated so much of the treasuries of the temple, of the king's palace and so forth and his court, uh, 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 that they, they replaced the gold all the gold that the enemy had taken back to Egypt with brass. So now we have brass utensils, brass sacred things. Now we have brass shields and all those kind of things instead of gold. 
So that means every time I go to worship, every time the king goes into the palace with his counselors and the government authorities that help him lead, they're reminded, they're reminded, okay, of the consequences of forsaking God. Just a visual aid. Now, you have to understand the Lord wasn't, wasn't being unforgiving when he left the consequences. He wasn't being unforgiving. The Lord wasn't being mean. The Lord wasn't holding a grudge. But these consequences were left in place to encourage these people not to do something like this again. Do you understand that? And the same thing with us, and this this is not part of my sermon, but the same thing with us. Listen, if, if we've walked away from the Lord and we've forsaken him and we've come back and we humbled ourselves before him and in his grace he lifts us up again, and the Bible says he will, and 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 we 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 struggle with the consequences of where we've been and what we've done or didn't do, okay? Uh, listen, we have to understand that's God in his wisdom and understanding leaving that there. Teach us some more lessons. Remind us. Listen, we don't want to go down this other road and walk away from him and forsake him again. Do you understand that? So, so in a way, it's a good thing. We squirm and we worm about consequences of whatever it was. Listen, in a strange way, let the consequences be a blessing. Let them be a lesson. Let them be something that will remind us of the Lord and that we walk close to him rather than get far away from him. So the Lord's doing the same thing with this situation. So we, we see how wise he is and how knowledgeable he is. And he does this because he knows our heart were prone to what? Wander with an A, you know? So he's trying to help them to stay, to stay in fellowship and communion with him. And then you have verse number 12. You can look at verse number 12. You can read verse number 12 for yourself while I'm talking to you. Verse number 12, that should be the wonderful ending of the story. That should be the wonderful ending conclusion of the story. That that in their humility, they humbled themselves before the Lord. They said he was righteous. We've sinned. We made the mistake. This is not right. And uh, so, so we've come back to the Lord and he spared uh, the city from ruin, the rest of the kingdom from ruin. But he left them some of the consequences that would help them remember, walk with him, don't walk away next time. And uh, and so everybody's blessed. Things are well. You humble yourself. God exalts you. It happened in the kingdom. Everything is good. And that should be, that's where we want this story to end because that's where the sermon would stop. Didn't happen like that. So, the sermon goes on. Okay? We would think it would be the happy ending, but it's not. Number four in verses 13 through 16, you see the stubborn king's propensity or nature or tendency or bent or disposition to ignore the Lord. So once it's good, then he decides to walk away from God again. What's the matter with this guy? You know? What's going on? In verse 13, all goes well. Verse 14, all goes wrong. You, you know what? If, if you would read about Rehoboam's life, and I know you probably won't, so I did, and I'll let you know what I found out, okay? Now, I'm not picking on you. Uh, you know, I, you don't, you're not going to open your Bible and read about Rehoboam's life. You know, you, you're going to look for something else, you know? But listen, if you read about Rehoboam, you know, he never did have a, listen to me, he never really had a lifestyle of humility before his God. A lifestyle of contrition before his God. He did, but, but it's interesting, he did from time to time. You know, God would send a messenger, he'd heed the message from the man of God that came from the mind and mouth of God, and he would humble himself for a season. He would humble himself for a, a, a period of time. But, but it was never a lasting legacy of a humble heart before the Lord. 
And, and it seems to be that, you know, when it really got hot and heavy and looked like doom and gloom is like just going to come down and it's over, he, he would relent. I guess that's the word. You know what? You would have, you would have thought he would have gotten it for his life. That God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. That if you'll humble yourself before the Lord, he'll lift you up. You think he would have gotten that for his own life, for his own life, uh, for his kingdom, just in general, the kingdom that he ruled, and for the people of his kingdom. You think he would have gotten it, he would have figured it out as time went by, that God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble, James chapter 4, verse 6, but he didn't. He just didn't. This is interesting. I'm just, I'm, I'm almost near the end of my sermon. You said, really? Yeah. And it's two minutes after 12. Listen to me. This is really important. And just think about this. This like sort of in an odd way piggybacks off of last week's sermon. And I didn't plan it that way, but it came out that way. Listen, the king became full of pride. The king became full of pride when he was in his rightful place as king. That, that's what he did. The king became full of pride when he was in his rightful place as being king. That's where he belonged. That's who he was. That is what he was supposed to do. But when he's in his rightful place, he becomes full of pride. He, he never became, listen to me, he never became a ready servant with a passion for humility to use his rightful place to glorify God and to do good for others. He didn't do it. He didn't do it. He's in his rightful place. Things go well. He walks away from God. He never had a humble servant's heart toward God nor toward the people that he ruled. Walked away from God would not do his people good. He wouldn't glorify God, would not do his people good. He never did that. He never got that. Now, if he would have done that, you understand what I just said, right? So I can go to my next, my last page of notes. Listen, you understand what I just said? Listen, if he would have done that, if he would have done that, he would have been rewarded during Being in his rightful place as king, he would have been rewarded. The Lord would have rewarded him, and the people would have blessed him. It didn't happen. You know what? Uh, one of the most uh, really, I'm, I'm pretty surprised when you when you when you take a look at this. Yeah, that one of the most dominating Christian themes in the Bible is that our lives are characterized with humility, are characterized by humility. Humility. That humility would be a way of life. Okay? So as you are in your rightful place, Okay, whatever that might be. And that could be in leadership. That could be in what, whatever it is. You're in your rightful place that you're there that, that pride doesn't arise in your life. You, you keep a servant's heart that you are under subjection to the Lord. And then that also, that in a way, even if you're a leader, that you submit to the followers to help them love them and care for them and be a blessing to them. Okay. Humility. A way of life. Just as the Lord Jesus humbled himself, it says in Philippians chapter 2, yeah, 5 through 11. Even though he was God, God the Son, he obeyed the Father's will. And though he was equal with the Father, you know, he, he, he humbled himself and became the servant 
and humbled himself to the point where he went to the cross and gave his life for us. You understand? So what you, what you have in, in his rightful place in the Trinity as God the Son, he's not filled with pride. No, he has a servant's heart. And he humbled himself to the Father's will to go to the cross to save us, to glorify the Father and to bless us with salvation. That's not all. Now, because he did that, it says the Father now highly exalts him. See? In his place, now he's highly exalted. He has praise. He has honor. He has that exaltation from the Father that what? That one day, whose knee? Everybody's knee is going to bow to Christ and proclaim him as Lord. See, we think humility is a sissy thing. We think humility is a, is a flimsy thing. We think humility is, is we're a doormat and we're just, you know, just, we're just run over. We don't, we don't like this thing of humility, but it's to characterize our lives as Christians. And not only that, we read one more thing. The singers want to come. We're going to have our last song. Out of Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, that should encourage us in this thing of us being humble. So wherever you're at in your rightful place, that's great. From that rightful place, please be humble. Be a humble person. Have a servant's heart. Be submissive to the Lord and his will. And be submissive to others in the sense of sensitive to their lives, to their needs, and what you can offer them from your rightful place. Listen, the Bible tells us as Christians we're to prefer one another. That means to put the other person first, to think about the other person first. Even in the matter of husbands and wives, in Ephesians chapter 5, it, it talks about submitting yourselves one to another, the husband and wife. Listen, you're in your rightful place in the marriage, but, but listen, have a servant's heart. Be humble. So you're able to honor God and be a blessing to somebody else in that rightful place because you're not filled with pride and demand of others. So with that in mind, I'm going to read my last verses and we're going to conclude. May God help us to be humble people. It takes quite a person to be a humble person. It takes a walk with God. It, it takes eyes to see what's going on around you and where God has placed you and what authority he has given you. And that you properly handle that in a way that honors him and helps somebody else. And in that humility of servant heart, as time goes by, God will what? Lift you up, exalt you to where he wants you to be. Now, since I like rules, I like rules. I was told the other day by my loving wife, look out. What, what was the first thing you said I'm not? What was the first thing? I forget the first thing. See, I, I, you forget, I forget. It was only yesterday. You forgot, I forgot. We forgot our name tags too. I know. But listen, she said, you're dogmatic. Yes. Well, you don't have to get excited about it. I just, yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't mind rules. I'm okay with rules and I'm okay with duty. It doesn't bother me. I, I'm good with it. I, I have rules for everything. I told her that's how I get things done. I, I can't, you got to have some kind of structure in life. Anyway, so I like this. So we have the example of Christ. We have the poor example of the king and his counselors. We have the example of Christ, supreme example of humility. And we have an exhortation or the command to walk humbly with our God.
Listen to what it says. I'm going to start with verse number six out of Micah chapter six, verse six. Wherewith all shall I come before the Lord? How should I come before the Lord? And bow myself before the high God. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Should I, should I bring offerings? Should I bring animal sacrifice? Will the Lord be pleased with, with thousands of rams? How about a thousand rams, two thousand rams? You know, all these offerings. Or with ten thousands of rivers of oil, the, 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 uh, shall I give my firstborn for my transgression? How about if I give up my, my, my child because of my sins? You know, sacrifice my kid for my sins, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? And then we have the answer. Verse 8. He has shown thee. Here's the answer. I've given you the answer now, he says. He's saying, he has shown thee, O man, what is good. What's good? What's good? And what doth the Lord ah, require of thee? But to do justly, be just in your dealings with people, just like God is with us. To love mercy, be merciful, just like God is with us. And in that, to walk, what? Humbly with thy God. Heavenly Father, we'd ask you bless what we've heard. So much more could be said, but this is enough for now. We just, we just pray that you would help us to think about the topic And think how we, we, we do this in our lives as believers. And may, may humility in our lives be a, be a way of life, be a, a lifestyle part integrated into our lives. This is how we are instead of an incident from time to time that takes place in our lives. We pray that we wouldn't be like the king from time to time, but we would be all the time, walking humbly with our God, having a servant's heart toward you and your will, and for those that are around us, of how we can minister to them and help them. And in that, Lord, you'll lift us up, you'll exalt us as you see fit. Amen.